Um, so since this is Children's Book Week, uh, we're going to talk a lot about children's literature. So um, my first question for you is, what spurred your interest in comics? And do you think graphic novels are making, how do you think graphic novels are making an impact in children's literature today? <laughs> Where to begin? <laughs> um, so... Hi, I'm Raina. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm like, should we introduce ourselves or anything? Sure. So, so oh. Raina. Okay. Feel free. Thanks. Um, so I'm the author of the books Smile, Sisters, and Drama, and I illustrated the Babysitter's Club graphic novels, and um, I have a book coming out this fall called Ghosts, which I'm really excited about. And um, I started reading comics when I was nine years old, and I was a San Franciscan, so that was thanks to the San Francisco Chronicle. And I fall in love with Calvin and Hobbes, and for better or for worse, and Foxtrot, and Peanuts, and Luann. And I started drawing my own comics when I was 10, and then they were really bad. But um, I stuck with it, and I, I went to school in uh, New York City at a school called the School of Visual Arts. And they have a cartooning program there. So um, I, I got really into comics and making my own and, and making mini comics, and then... Uh, I mean, Gene and I met through mini comics once upon a time because we used to do small fest, small press festivals together. Um, and I've been making comics professionally since 2006, so it's my tenth year doing it, and it's really great. And the the second part of the question was about impact. Yeah, how do you think graphic novels are making an impact today in children's literature instead of the funny papers? Right. Well, instead of or alongside, I feel yes. like the funny paper, papers are still really important to me and the people who read them. Yeah. And now people read uh, like comic strips online as well. So they reach an even bigger audience than they used to. But um, I mean, we, we've seen just a tidal wave in the last 10 years of interest and of amazing publishers who are stepping up to the plate to publish more and more graphic novels. So, I mean, 10 years ago, there were a few. The shelf was small, and now the shelf is enormous, and I feel like kids just can't get enough of them. Thank it's, you. it's kind of awesome. I, I think Raina and I actually have very parallel stories. I think this is probably true of a lot of cartoonists roughly around our age. A lot of us grew up reading some form of comic books. I started reading comics when I was in fifth grade. I still remember the very first comic that my mom bought for me. It was a DC Comics Presents starring Superman in the Atomic Knights. You guys know who the Atomic Knights are? They're these dudes, <laughs> they dress up in medieval armor and they ride around these giant mutated dogs. <laughs> kind of awesome. So that was the, the, that was the main character, like Superman and the Atomic Knights. Those were the main characters in this comic. That comic blew my mind. And after that, I started making comics. I think I was around 10, too. I, I, I used to make comics with my best friend in, in fifth grade, a guy named Jeremy Kanyoshi. So we would brainstorm stories together. I would do all the pencils. He would do all the inks. Then his mom would photocopy them for us at work. We would staple these photocopies together and sell them to our friends for 50 cents a piece. We made $8. It was, it was awesome. <laughs> Jeremy's not a cartoonist anymore. He's actually a radiologist. Good for him. Uh, but but I, I kept making comics. And, and I think when I was a kid, you know, when we were growing up, like Raina, Raina mostly read uh, comic strips, which I think were a little bit more diverse in terms of genre, if not in other ways, right? A little bit. But I read mostly comic books. And when I was a kid, really all you could find were superhero comics. I, I think one of the ways in which comics has impacted children's books and children's books has impacted comics is that now we actually have a diversity of different kinds of stories in comics and different kinds of characters. I think that's been absolutely amazing. Yes, and you guys both have done a really great job of showing that different representation of comics and not just doing superheroes, even though, Gene, you are writing for Superman currently, the new Superman. I am, which is so, weird, right? Like, yes. my first comic was Superman, and now I'm actually writing for, for Superman. No yeah. pressure. It's a weird, it's a weird thing. And Raina, you are, you read the Babysitter's Club series and now you're, you have written for the Babysitter's Club. So it does come full circle. I just found fan art that I did when I was 10 of the Babysitter's Club and yes. like, it's amazing. It was, it was in continuity. Like Stacy had just moved to New York City. So Stacy's not in the lineup. So I posted it to my Instagram and everybody was like, where's Stacy? And I was like, it's not that I don't love Stacy. It's just that she wasn't <laughs> there at the time. Yeah. So it's, it's really amazing. It was like cool to find that because I didn't remember doing it at all. So can I ask, like, um, did your designs for the characters change? <laughs> not really. From when you were, so it was kind of, even though you don't remember doing that art when you were 10, 
It was still somewhere in your subconscious. When I went back to read those books in order to adapt them, and this was happening in 2005, so this was 10 years ago. I mean, I hadn't read the Babysitter's Club novels since I was maybe like 12 years old. But when I read them, it was like no time had passed at all. I still saw them in my mind's eye in the exact same way, oh. which is to say that I still saw them looking like me and my friends. So I, I drew Christy like I draw myself. So now when people read Smile or in the Babysitter's Club, they're like, how come Christine Rinner are the same person? Is that actually you? And I'm like, not really. But she she was me in my head yeah, when yeah. I was that age. So it's it's very strange. That's awesome. Um, so uh, you guys both have written a lot of things on um, like – representing a vast diversity of people in comics. Um, Jean, you've done great things for Asian Americans in comics and writing different characters and protagonists with multifaceted uh, things, not stereotypes, although that's something that you get into in American-born Chinese, of course. Um, and you've re read the wrote the first gay character I've read, I've read in a children's comic, which I think is great. And I think representation is a good thing to have in, um, in comics in general. And can you talk about why representation in children's literature is important and how it's been different when you were kids versus now? Oh, it's definitely, it's definitely different yeah. now than, than when we were kids. Uh, I, 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 we kind of grew up roughly in the same area too. I grew up in the South Bay, which is about an hour from here, and then you grew up around here. I grew up in the city, yeah. Yeah, so I, I really, I, I kind of think that, like the Bay Area gets into you, you know, and it, it comes out in in these comics. Uh, for me, when I was a kid, I just remember that it was a really big deal to see an Asian American on TV. I remember, like, my brother and I would be watching, and then if some Chinese guy walked up on onto the screen, we'd like call our parents to come look. That's Aww. how that's how rare it was. We go, "There's a Chinese guy there," and then you'd be like, "Where?" So then, in the background, look right there, and they'd be like, "Wow!" <laughs> you know, it was like a big deal. Uh, and and uh, and I think I was felt. Like I always felt it. I always felt like I wanted to see characters who look like me and who look like my family in, in these comics. Even though I wasn't able to talk about it, that feeling was always there. So I do think for a lot of my books, um, that kind of drives it, you know? And, and it's not just seeing characters that look like me, it's seeing a world that looks like the one that I grew up in, the one the, the one that I lived in, you know? Uh, and and be, being from the Bay Area, you grew up around a lot of different kinds of people. And then when you start reading these books, you realize a lot of these different kinds of people don't make it into these stories. Um, <clears throat> this sounds really weird, but I was the minority growing up here. And I mean, I went to Lowell High School. Any Lowell lights in the house? Yeah, all right. I love when hands grow up. Class 95. Um, and, and at the time, I think Lowell was 65% Chinese. And then I think white was like the next largest uh, racial, but I don't even know the right words to use anymore. But, um, you know, I was not, I was not the majority. And so my friends did not the represent the majority that you see in the rest of America. So when I moved away from San Francisco for the first time, I went out to the East Coast and I was in New York for school. I was like, this is really disconcerting. Why is everybody white here? I don't understand it. So, so when I started making comics, I just, I was really really thoughtful to like make it look like it looked like I was growing up. I mean, my friends were every race and every um, orientation. And it was just what I saw and what I knew. And people told me I was being progressive. And I was like, what are you talking about? It's just life. Um, and, and putting gay characters into a middle school setting in drama, um, it was just me and my friends. You know, that was just what I saw. That's what I knew. And so I don't know. It's, it's important to me to show what I know. And we're lucky here. It's true. The yeah, Bay Area yeah, is a special so. place, and we we're we're all in it together, and we we love that about it. But I don't know. I feel I feel like we're yeah, just that we're lucky. Yeah, I think we are. I think we are. I actually think that every kid should have an experience where you're a part of the majority, and also an experience where you're a part of the minority. Because I think I think <laughs> both of those things together give you a more full picture of what mm -hmm. it's like to Absolutely. to grow up in these different environments. Yeah. Um, so people are discovering your books every in libraries every day, and they're seeing that representation. They're seeing themselves in their books. Um, could you name a book you discovered in the library when you were a kid and why it stuck with you? <laughs> I remember reading a book about Leif Erikson, who's a Viking. <laughs> I had to do like a book report on him, and I was just like, yeah, he's so cool. He like wears those like crisscross things on his legs. And he like, I don't know. I just remember being like really into Vikings when I was like, Seven. 
That's a terrible example, but it just <laughs> sticks out in my head. So does Lisa Erickson represent you as a person? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yes. I have my wooden boat and everything <laughs> up at in my apartment. Yeah. That's awesome. Wait, so are you going to do a Viking comic? Totally. That the, that's the, that's the plan. It's as Ghosts of right this second. And then Vikings. Vikings. That's perfect. Sure. Totally. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was really little, my favorite book um, in the library was this one called Happy Birthday to You by Dr. Seuss. Do you guys know that? Have, do you know that book? <laughs> I think you've talked about it. Yeah, I love that book. I loved it. I checked it out over and over and over again. I mean, partially because I loved getting birthday presents, right? I was a greedy kid. Um, but also, there's this passage in the book where they talk about um, the terror of non-existence, which is... <laughs> It like blew my mind when I was a kid, right? He talks about how like you should be thankful that you're not a wasn't, mm. that you're not, that you actually exist. And when I was a kid, I just remember looking at that page and being like kind of freaked out and thrilled all at the same time. And that, that really stuck with me. Yeah. Dr. Seuss sticks with a lot of kids. My yeah, first book yeah. was, Oh, the places you'll go. Okay. And that's one of those ones where it's like thinking broadly about how you're going to be when you yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's like underneath those primary colors is something really deep and really like gets to the core of what it means to be a human. Okay. Now I have a silly question. Um, Jean, you write for superheroes and right now you've read, read in an X-Men um, comic. So, um, if you were, um, a superhero, what would your name be and what would your powers be? Oh man. <laughs> Do you have one? I'd be the weather girl. <laughs> you totally thought of that before. I thought of that before. Well, like when I first read about Storm, I was like, no, like that's what I want to do. Because I used to be obsessed with the weather. And maybe it's a San Francisco thing where the weather just never changes. So when it does, even a little bit, you're like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. Like, wow, it's raining. What a concept. But um, yeah, so I can't be Storm because Storm already exists. But I think I'd be the weather girl. I also used to be obsessed with Pat McCormick. I feel like I'm in like my hometown, so I can talk about this. Pat McCormick used to be the weatherman for Fox Five News, and he had like a puppet show. Also, he was just so I'd sit through the whole news just to get to the weather because I loved Pat McCormick so much. Yeah, so this is this is premeditated, wow. Gene. I'm sorry to. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you totally tried to play it off like it was coming, but. You have thought about this since you were a kid. Since I was a kid. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I don't know. I, I think um, when I, well, you know, those comics that I was doing with Jeremy, that, that the, the, the character that we created for that comic is probably who we wanted to be when we were, in, when we were 10 years old, you know? And, and the main character, his name, was, um, his name was Spade Hunter, which is not a great name. But the reason why we chose it was because um, we both really liked the shape of the spade in a deck of cards. And um, the spade, like, so he, so he wore a suit with, like, a spade on it. And then um, his, he, di he didn't really have any powers. He was kind of like Robin Hood. He wore all green. He lived in the woods. So the, the one thing that, would, that made him different from Robin Hood is that he had this discus of death. And that was his weapon. He'd throw it at people's heads. We thought it was awesome. And that was based on the swing that I had in my backyard back then. We had the circular swing that only had one, one rope. Oh, I had like, one of those. Like, you did. You, like, I don't think it. they make those anymore because kids crack their heads on them. Like <laughs> at, one of my friends actually cracked her head falling <laughs> off of that thing in her backyard, right? But that eventually fell off, and then we, we, my brother and I would used to throw it at each other as a discus of death. So I think that's that's who I would want to be. So no, like radioactive spider bite or like how you came about your powers. Oh, okay. well, yeah, if I had to get bitten by a radioactive animal, I would prefer that it would be a pterodactyl, right? Oh, yeah. Like out of all the animals. Sure. Or wings. Yeah. As opposed to a spider. A spider's not as interesting as a pterodactyl. <laughs> okay, so you guys have been working together, or not working together, but um, fans of each other's work for a long time. Um, what is your favorite book of Reina's, and what is your favorite book of Jean's? <laughs> Putting us to the test. My yeah. my favorite book of Raina's is Sisters. I think yeah. I think she gets better with each book, personally. Thanks, and, Jean. And, and I think that that book is uh, is is pretty amazing. Um, I have four kids. I have a boy and three daughters, and my daughters, especially all of them, but my daughters especially, are obsessed with Raina. They love <laughs> Raina. They love Raina so much more than they love me. <laughs> It feels so sad. Like when I ask them what they think of my books, they go, they always say the same thing. They always go, it's all right. It's not as good as Raina. It's all right. 
Are they in the audience right now cheering her on? They're not. They're okay. not. They're actually at a track meet. They okay. really wanted to come, but they had to go to a track meet. They don't love me that much. <laughs> <laughs> track meets are better. Um, Your it's, mom made them go to the track meet. <laughs> they wanted to come here. It's really hard for me to choose a favorite gene book. Um, I mean, I've been. I, I started reading American Born Chinese when it was still mini comics. And I remember thinking like that I had reached the end of the story because I had read up to like the halfway point in the mini comics. And I was like, that was good. And then the book came out and I was like, oh my gosh, like it just, <laughs> like there's so much more to it. And it was, it was just so amazing. I mean, what a, what a way to come out the gate swinging with American Born Chinese. That, that book is just astounding. If you guys have not read American Born Chinese yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, so good. And I mean, I, I'm a huge, huge fan of Boxers and Saints too. I just, I can't believe the things you were able to do with that series. Do you call it a series or do you call it a set or, or that? They they had a fancy word for it. I forget. Die something. I forget. A First diptych? Second. Yes. Oh, okay. That's what they called it. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Figured it out. Um, I also really like Secret Coders, which oh, yeah. I read pretty recently and was like, this is so much fun. I need, I know I'm going to learn to code and I'm not a, I'm not a numbers person. I'm not a techie person at all, but it kind of made me want to be one. Awesome. Awesome. And also, I mean, the Avatar comics, like, I could just geek on forever <laughs> about Jean's work. It's so good. We were both Avatar fans yeah. before. Avatar, yeah, Avatar The Last yeah, Airbender. Yeah. Not the movie that the Shyamalan yeah. made. No, 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 no. But yeah, the, the, TV the, yes, the TV show. Yes. And Korra. And Korra was Whew. amazing. Anyway, was amazing. just geek out for yeah. 20 minutes about Avatar. Anything else that you guys are major fans of that you've become fans of recently? Like cartoons, comics? Well, I'm, I'm a fan of Jason Shiga. We're friends. Um, but I think I actually like him better as a cartoonist than I do as a friend. He's an amazing, I mean, he's all right as a friend. He's an amazing cartoonist. That dude is like, so he, he did this book called Meanwhile, which all of you should read. Uh, Meanwhile is like a maze and a comic book had a baby. It's a choose your own adventure comic. Amazing book. And gonna, he also wrote a book called The Librarian, which I think is why a lot of library people would Yeah, oh, want Book Hunter. To, he, he did a book yeah, called Book Hunter. Hunter. Yeah, That's which is it. great. So just like if, if you don't turn in your library cur- books, the book hunter the, comes, the book after, comes you. after you. Comes yeah. after you. So watch out. Yeah. Jason is a superhuman. He's he is. he's a superhuman being. Um, I'm a big fan of the Hilda series by Luke Pearson, uh, published by No Brow Flying Eye Press, and they're they're these sort of like large format, almost French style. Um, they're like 64 pages long, I think, but they're, they're these little graphic novellas and Luke just puts so much beauty and wonder into his books. If you're a fan of Miyazaki's films at all, mm-hmm. I recommend the Hilda series very strongly. Um, I also just read Nimona by Noelle Stevenson mm-hmm. and loved it. Yeah. So good. I'm trying to steal your, uh, C.C. Bell. C.C. Bell. Bell's El Defo. God, if you're a Smile or a Sisters fan, El Defo is an outstanding, outstanding book. It was the first graphic novel to be given a Newbery honor. And when that happened, I just, just like crying tears of joy for C.C., who's also a very good friend of mine. Oh, great. Thank you, guys. Um, so both of you guys have written like in Smile and in American Boy or in Chinese about struggling to fit in. Um, how many experiences or can you tell us about an experience about you struggling to fit in in middle school and high school, which is when your main books are? Just one. Just one. Yeah. <laughs> you can do a you dozen if you want. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, a lot of the stuff in American Born Chinese was based on my childhood, especially my middle school years. I grew up, uh, the, the community that I grew up in is now um, like 60 or 70% Asian American. When my family first moved in, we were just one of a handful of Asian American families in there. And as I was growing up, the community changed, right? And I think that any time you have rapid change like that, some stuff comes out. So when I was in junior high, there was a, a group of kids that we used to call the stoners. Um, they uh, wore heavy metal t-shirts. You guys know what that is? Heavy metal? <laughs> it's like this music that we used to listen to before they invented rap. Uh, they would wear heavy metal t-shirts. Kind of like, simultaneous to rap. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was simultaneous to rap. But rap kind of overshadowed it. Don't you we know? called them headbangers. Yes, we called them headbangers. It was like like men with long hair. They would wear women's makeup. It was, it was kind of awesome. Anyways, <laughs> so they would wear these heavy metal t-shirts. They'd wear ripped jeans. And, and I was hanging out with a small group of Asian American um, boys at the time and anytime we passed each other in the halls you know my friends and these stoners they would almost always yell something you know, like insensitive 
at us. Uh, so, so a lot of those words ended up in American-born Chinese. But what I realized, looking back as an adult on those experiences, is um, junior high was the very first time that I stopped feeling comfortable hanging out with um, my non-Asian classmates. And largely, it was because I was internalizing these things that I was hearing in my in, in the hallways, you know, like, like I, I remember wondering if um, everybody who was around me who was an Asian thought the way these stoners did, but the stoners were just the ones that were brave enough to say it, to say it out loud. You know, now, now as an adult, I can look back and I can see that was just my middle school paranoia playing out. But, um, but I do remember that was, that was a big deal when I was growing up. Well, I, I really tried hard to write about this experience and smile, but I'm going to pretend that none of you have read Smile and tell you what it's about. Um, when I was a sixth grader at Aptos Middle School, um, I tripped and fell one evening and knocked out my two front permanent teeth and then had to spend four and a half years dealing with braces and surgery and headgear. And this was in sixth grade. It was my first year at Aptos. And I was, you know, a really shy kid to begin with. And I was um, already kind of self-conscious. And so losing my two front teeth kind of brought it to an extreme level that I don't think anyone should ever have to deal with. But, um, you know, I felt really isolated. People teased me. I got bullied for it. And people were just really curious. But I was a very sensitive kid and didn't know how to articulate what I was feeling. And it, it took a long time for me to really get my self-confidence back. And that did coincide with getting my teeth fixed in a lot of ways. And so that's kind of what the story ends up being about. But um, the the experience was was brutal. And I feel like every kid goes through something, maybe not as extreme as that, but something that makes them feel like an outcast or something that makes them feel like they don't look the way everybody else does or they're not normal or something else. And um, I was shocked at how many people could relate to the story, even if they haven't busted their face. They're like, oh my gosh, well, I had this time where everyone's had a time where uh, something happened to them. And and being able to share that story with other people can really make you feel connected to others. So so the thing that made me feel like the biggest outcast of all ended up being the thing that connected me to millions of people through the story. And I think that's really the power of books is uh, being able to relate to other people and being able to empathize with others. And um, in the case of comics, it's just so personal somehow. It just feels like you are talking directly to the character or that you are the character. And maybe it's something about the art being sort of friendly and representative and it doesn't necessarily look like a real person. Like in American Born Chinese, your characters are very cartoony. And so you can easily see yourself in any of them. And I think readers can see themselves in my characters for the same reason. So there's just this... When you're watching a movie, you're seeing an actor play a role. Or when you're reading a book with just words, you're imagining it in your head. But something about comics just, just brings you right there. So, um, yeah, I'm getting way off topic. But it's, it's, been, it's been sort of a brilliant revelation to realize the power of storytelling through this medium as a result of this horrible experience I had when I was 11. <laughs> I don't think it's off topic at all because people can see themselves and work through their struggle with fitting in with mm -hmm. books and, um, and with your books in particular. Do you guys have any books that um, helped you through a hard time recently, um, whether it be struggling to fit in or um, just something that you're like, oh, I can relate to this. I see myself in this character recently or, or just in our lives. I mean, honestly, I like I, I work through my own stuff in my books. Yeah. Like, I, I'm always working through whatever it is that I'm dealing with through my work. Um, I remember reading when I was younger, For Better or For Worse in particular, which is a comic strip by Lynn Johnston that's no longer being syndicated, but it was syndicated from 1979 until <laughs> 29 years later. What's the math there? Uh, Any. Uh, yeah, none of us knows how to add, but <laughs> it was a long time, and that was it was during my adolescence. So I felt like I I had these characters that I could see every single day in the comic strip pages, and they were going through the same stuff as I was, and it just it it just taught me that it was okay, whatever it was I was experiencing, I was not alone, and it was okay, and that was hugely important to me. And I still credit Lynn Johnston as my biggest influence for that reason. She was writing about real people, real lives, real problems. Um, it helped me through so, so, so many things from the time I was a kid until the time I was a grown up. I mean, I grew up reading superhero comics, so I think that had a huge impact on the way I think about the world. I, I do think there's something about superheroes, especially the ones that wear like some kind of a mask where that mask allows you to imagine yourself 
inside of that suit. You know, especially like Spider-Man. Anybody could be under that Spider-Man suit. Uh, and, and the fact that uh, behind every superhero are these two ideas. Number one is you always put others before yourself. And number two is you never give up. No matter how bad you're getting beat down by Dr. Octopus, you just keep on going. You know, <laughs> and, and I think those um, two ideas really embedded themselves inside of me through me reading these superhero comics. Right. Um, so what is a book that you really loved reading recently? What's your last favorite read book? I, I do a lot of reading to my kids, you know, and, um, and I could tell you the one that we have to return to over and over and over again, the, the few, um, because that's what little kids especially like to do, right? They like to read the same book over and over again. There's one that called Little P that my youngest daughter just loves. It's uh, the author's Amy Krause. I don't remember the illustrator's name, but it's an amazing book. It's a, it's about um, in the world of peas, like these little talking peas, like green peas. Okay, there's a mama pea and a papa pea and a, and a little baby pea. Um, what they have to eat for dinner is candy. And little P hates eating candy. So her parents force her to eat candy in order to get her dessert. And her dessert, of course, is spinach. So, so that's, uh, that's, that's been, like, I've read that book so many times to my daughter. Uh, my oldest son, when he was around that age, the book that he loved was uh, Day Glow Brothers by, I think his name is Christopher Pike. And it's about, it's, it's a nonfiction book. My, my older son is um, like the exact opposite of me. All he reads is nonfiction. And when I was a kid, all I read was like fantasy and superhero stuff, you know? So I don't, I don't totally get, like he looks like me, but his reading habits are the exact opposite. Anyways, Dayglow Brothers, it's actually a nonfiction book about these two brothers who invent the Dayglow colors. And it talks about how they invented them, how the Dayglow color, uh, uh, the Dayglow colors helped the allies win the, the war. It was like, it's, it's an amazing book. Done in this beautiful, like, 1950s inspired style with all these day glow colors weaved in. Yeah, wonderful book. Um, I, this, I feel like I'm really behind the curve here. A lot of you are going to laugh at me for this, but I really only recently started to appreciate Mo Willems' work. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've known Mo actually for a while now, and I, but I didn't have any kids in my life. I don't, I don't have kids myself and I don't have a lot of like young cousins or anything like that. So um, I only just recently started reading his work. And part of it is because I have a friend who's got a six month old. So I'll go visit my friend and she's like, hey, I want to go do another grown-up thing. Can you entertain the baby for a few few minutes? Here, here's some Mo Willems books to read. So we'll start reading the pigeon books and I'll start doing the voices. And I'll notice that my friends stop doing what they're doing and they'll come and like sit and like listen to me read the books. And it's just the most fun experience ever to to read the pigeon and to go through the pigeon's emotions with. And the kid is just like, like she's six months, but she's just like fascinated by everything, which I, I don't know. Mo Willems is just a genius. And I just was in New York and got to see his show, which is at the New York Historical Society. And it's sort of a retrospective of his career. And it's amazing. Um, and as far as graphic novels goes, I, I, I have been a fan for a long time of Svetlana Chmakova's work. But she recently published a book called Awkward. And it's a middle school graphic novel about these kids who are like in a science competition. And, and she is just a brilliant cartoonist. She's so, so good at nailing jokes. And I think for me, like if a graphic novel is not funny, I'm not going to be that interested in it. I want funny graphic novels. I want them to be entertaining and poignant and, and sad and emotional, but I want them to be hilarious as well. So awkward. Also, if you haven't read this book, it's so good. Geek, geek, geek. <laughs> yeah, I see the comic experience in all of your works, too. You always have this comic relief panel, like, with the expressions on people's faces. You have to laugh. I've, I've read a lot of comics. Yeah. And I think the more <laughs> comics you read, the more you realize what makes you laugh, and then you try to go for that in your own work. Um, and I, I became a fan of manga maybe, like, 10 or 15 years ago, and I think that really influenced my storytelling as well. Just they, they just go to some bonkers places with their facial expressions and they just, they have, they kind of have their own visual language in Japan that they've been honing for the past, I don't know, four or five decades. And it's, it's just, it's just outrageous. And it's just so funny. Another thing I'm really a huge fan of is Yotsuba by Kiyohiku Azuma. That's like my favorite series. And it's about this little kid and she's weird. <laughs> that is the elevator pitch, but she, it's it's so 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 funny. It feels like I'm reading Calvin and Hobbes again for the first time when I read Yotsuba. Um, y o t 
S-U-B-A. Did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> For those of you who are like, wait, what? What did you? Yotsuba. And they're in, available in the Children's Center now. Yes. So you if you guys make your way up there, you can she, check them out. She has green hair. Yes. I mean, that's all. Yeah. There's flowers in the yeah. covers. and Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, why are books for kids important? Why do you write books for kids and young adults? Well, I, I um, you know, I, I think, uh, I don't know if this is true for you, but when I was doing my comics, I wasn't really thinking about age demographics, especially when you're doing mini comics, you're just doing mini comics. You don't really, like, you're, you just hope that you can get 16 people to read your comic, you know? Um, I, I didn't get categorized as young adult until after I signed with my current publisher for second books. And retro, you know, fr retroact, like, looking back at it, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Looking back at it, I do think that's a great fit for me. I, I think um, there's something about coming of age stories. There's something about that formation of identity um, that I find fascinating and that I return to over and over again. I think I'm just stuck being 11. I think in my head, I'm still in middle school. I'm still like annoyed with the thing that, you know, my locker is like not opening right. Like I just, I spend a lot, way too much time thinking about how I felt when I was 11 and the things that happened to me when I was that age and the friends I had and, you know, the experiences that I had. But, um, yeah, I don't know. And, and I think most of what I like to read skews young as well. And I, I'm at the kids' table perpetually. Like, when I go to parties, I'm like, oh, grown-ups, whatever. And then the kids are there. And I'm like, hey, what are you guys doing over here? Like, I just, I would just rather hang out with the kids most of the time. So, um, that's not why they're important, though. I think I got way <laughs> off topic. That's why I write them. Yeah. Um, but, but I think that it's important for somebody be, to be at the kids' table. I think that we as adults do have retrospective wisdom or something, maybe, I don't know, hopefully. Um, and, and the connections that adults and kids make together through books is, is a wonderful thing. And I, I like seeing parents and their kids share my books. I like, I like seeing that they cross generations and that they start conversations between generations because I think that's really important. And, and it's, it's all to reassure my 11 year old self that it's going to be okay. So that's, that's my goal through my work is to tell myself 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever, that it's all going to be okay. All right. Um, now you guys have to ask each other questions because I ran out of questions. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Jean. <laughs> so um, our STEM learning event starts today. In case you guys didn't know, they're wearing our Reading Ranger badges. You can get one yourself. Um, if you read 15 hours this summer, and you can sign up upstairs in the Children's Center at your local library, wherever that may be, um, hopefully in San Francisco, because that's where the Reading Ranger badges are. Um, uh, so if you had, do you have any books that you would want to recommend? I know you keep mentioning books, but you have to mention more. Um, <laughs> do you, do you have any books that you want, you would recommend that people go upstairs and grab to start their summer reading and get their Reading Ranger badge? Well, I were, well when, I, when I was a kid, I loved the uh, Book of Three series mm -hmm. by Lloyd Alexander, which is still fairly popular. Uh, um, amazing fantasy series. I, I don't know if I really liked fantasy that much before I read that, that series. Um, I'll just tell you my favorite books when I was a kid. I really, really loved Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim by Robert C. O'Brien, Newberry winner. Such a fantastic book. Well, well, well written. Um, my other favorite book when I was a kid was called In the Year of the Boar and Jackie Robinson, which is about a girl who moves from China with her family to Brooklyn in the 1950s when Jackie Robinson's career, wait, 50s or 40s? Uh, whenever Jackie Robinson was first playing for the Dodgers. And so she sort of gets assimilated into American culture by learning how to play stickball and learning about, you know, baseball and everything. And it's 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 been one of my favorite books since I was like eight or nine years old. So my my... If I, if I could have like a dream project, it might be to adapt that into a graphic novel, but we'll see, we'll see. All right, now we're gonna open up the floor to questions. Does anyone have questions for Jean and Raina?